Well, greetings from uh, to wherever you are in the world. It's good to be with you today. Um, my name is Dr. Carl Gomlik. I am a neuro-ophthalmologist and although I have for the last 30 years been in Cincinnati, Ohio, recently uh, moved to Phoenix, Arizona. So I now live in the in what we call the desert southwest in the United States. So we're going to be talking this morning, or for me this morning, about approach to the patient with unexplained vision loss. This is something that certainly every neuro-ophthalmologist and probably every ophthalmologist sees uh, in, their, in their practice. Uh, I see it more or less on a daily basis. So I see a lot of patients who are sent in with, uh, gee, their eyes look normal. Why can't they see? And that's sort of the basis of this talk. Um, so I have no financial disclosures regarding this topic. And my objective is that when we're done, you will be able to outline a simple approach to the patient with unexplained vision loss. And by that, I mean unexplained where you look at the eyes and really things look fairly normal and you can't find out a cause. And so this is the, the outline, basically, and this is what I tell patients. In fact, as recently as this past Friday, I told the patient with unexplained vision loss, the first thing we have to do when you're approaching a patient who has what looks like a normal exam is figure out where is the problem? Is it the front of the eye? Is it refractive or media? Is it the eye, in the eye? Is it a retina or choroid? Or is it behind the eye? Is it the optic nerve and visual pathways? And then, of course, it may be none of these because some patients who have uh, unexplained vision loss don't really have vision loss. They have non-organic vision loss, and we'll talk about that uh, in turn. So I'm going to start with a case that I call the case of the drinking dentist. This is a 60-year-old gentleman who complains of gradual bilateral blurry vision, and he has lived um, actually quite a far distance from where I am because he was attending his daughter's uh, medical school graduation. And he said, well, as long as I'm in town, why don't I see, get another opinion about my vision problem? Uh, and so he has high blood pressure that's controlled. He admits to drinking one vodka martini a day. And he was diagnosed in his hometown with tobacco, alcohol, amblyopia, which is uh, really um, a uh, bilateral optic neuropathy, not so much related to tobacco and alcohol, but related to not eating the right food. It's usually nutritional problems. And he had been told by um, his ophthalmologist in town to stop drinking. And he was so, sort of upset because um, the he has friends that drank more than one vodka martini in a day, and they were their vision was just fine. So he he was uh, skeptical that his uh, vision problem, which again would be usually lack of the right nutrition because patients who drink a lot sometimes don't eat the right foods. So he was told to stop drinking. And here is his exam. He was 2060 uh, or six, uh, what was that, 618, uh, J2 at near. Uh, so his acuity at near is a little better than at distance. He saw 10 of the 10 Hardy Rand Rittler color plates. I'll show those in a little bit later on. Um, his pupils were moderately active. There is no relative afferent pupillary defects. His fields were, visual fields were normal by confrontation. His fundus was normal. And the question is, is this compatible, just this little bit of information, is this compatible with a bilateral optic neuropathy where you've lost central vision? So, We'll talk a bit about refractive and media. When I became a neuro-ophthalmologist, you know, in the United States, we can really specialize. And um, in fact, my parents wanted to know which eye I was going to specialize in. Um, but I didn't think I'd be seeing what many problems with refractive or media ab abnormalities. But th things like irregular astigmatism, oil droplet cataracts. So these are cataracts that, as I explained to patients, it's kind of like if you had a glass of clear water and you took a drop of clear oil and you put it in the glass of water, you could still see that drop of oil. Why? They're both clear because the refractive index is different. And so you can see that drop of oil. And sometimes people can have not necessarily a cloudy yellow cataract, but they can have a very dense central nucleus. And so at least once every couple of months, I get a referral from a cataract surgeon 
uh, for unexplained vision loss, and they have an oil droplet cap. Occult corneal disease, so map dot dystrophy, things like that, things that aren't that obvious can cause problems with vision. And the evaluation is pretty simple. These are basic things. Something as simple as a pinhole, that visual test. Even a patient can understand that if their vision improves a lot, looking through a pinhole, they probably don't have a brain tumor or multiple sclerosis. Near vision is helpful. So if there's a disparity between distance and near vision, that's probably a refractive or a media problem. Of course, we have retinoscopy and corneal topography. We can look closely at the corneal light reflex, at the, at the for irregular astigmatism with the topography. Don't forget your direct ophthalmoscope. When I go to my residence clinic and ask them for a direct ophthalmoscope, they look at me like I've got two heads and say, oh, Dr. Golnick, you're so old. What, you know, we have much better techniques than direct ophthalmoscopy. We have slit lamp biomicroscopy. I said, well, I know that. But that's the point of slit lamp biomicroscopy. It cuts through those media opacities. A direct ophthalmoscope is a great way to judge the, uh, the media of a patient. If you can't see in well, they can't see out well. And then rigid contact lens over refraction can be done. I don't do that myself. I would send that to a, someone who does that. And don't forget color vision, which are neuro-ophthalmologists' secret weapon. Shouldn't really be a secret, but um, and the, the thing about this is that if you have lost central vision from an optic neuropathy, central vision, you're going to have decreased color vision. And most other conditions, color vision is not affected by refraction, media, even retinal disease, unless the acuity is pretty bad. So if the person has hand motion vision, of course, they're not going to see the color plates no matter what the problem is. But if they have vision in the you know, fairly normal to 636 or 672, color vision can be pretty normal. The hardy rand rittler plates, which are on the bottom right, are a bit more sensitive than the Ishihara color plates. I think that, that said, most people have the Ishihara color plates. Um, I use these interchangeably, unless I have someone with pretty good central vision. So if they're 20-20, 2025, so 6'6 six, six to 6'12 six, in that range, I'm going to specifically pick the Hardyman Rittler color plates because they're a bit more sensitive. I definitely have patients who have mild central loss of vision who do pretty well with the Ishihara color plates, but don't do very well at all with the HRR color plates. Um, there's a, a question that I see here about a role for automated color vision testing uh, providing threshold. Um, I, I don't, I don't, use automated color vision testing? I'm not sure I can really answer that, um, uh, that question well. I think I don't see why automated color vision couldn't be used. On the other hand, I wouldn't spend a lot of money to do it if it cost a lot of money. So what about our case, the case of the drinking dentist? Remember, he was 2060 or uh, 618. He was um, 6, 7.5 or 2025 equivalent near, he saw 10 of 10 of the HRR color plates. And the question is, is this compatible with a bilateral optic neuropathy with central vision loss? And if you were live, I would ask for some answers. Uh, but and the answer is, as we've just sort of discussed, the important points about this is no. He's, to, there are two things about this. Number one, he saw all of the color plates. If you're 618 with an optic nerve problem causing that, you are not going to see all the color plates. And there's a disparity between his distance and his near vision. So this, these two facts immediately make me think, all right, this is not nerve. Let's look what we need to look more closely at things that help to differentiate the, the uh, media and refractive problem. So further testing. So I, of course, I looked with my direct ophthalmoscope and my view was not that clear. It wasn't that clear. And so we did potential acuity meter. Probably most people don't have that, but that's a, a little uh, device that you can mount on a slit lamp and it shines a, um, a night chart through the media onto the retina. It was developed decades ago to try to, um, to try to, predict how good visual acuity would be after cataract surgery. And indeed he saw 2020. So we've shown that this has gotta be a problem with his media because this potential acuity meter 
reading was so good. And when we look closely with the slit lamp, we saw these oil droplet cataracts. And one other question about digitally presented Ishihara plates, um, equivalent to physical, I think they are. I think that that's fine if you have digital Ishihara color plates, use them. The other thing just to say quickly or, or briefly about color vision testing, sometimes my residents will say, oh, well, you know, they're, they have this peripheral visual problem, but their color vision is normal, so it must not be an optic nerve problem. Remember, the color vision thing is only important if they have abnormal central vision. So for instance, glaucoma, a very common optic neuropathy, you lose your central, your peripheral vision, and late on you lose central. But until you start losing central, your color vision is gonna be fine. Then you can have a terrible optic neuropathy. So remember, the color vision testing is helpful when the acuity is down from an optic nerve problem. And here's one other case to illustrate a couple of things, the case that I call of the worried traveler. And I was in fact on call on a Sunday night and I got a call from this 65 year old gentleman and he complained of blurred vision. He said, it was like when I had that retinal detachment and, so, and about five years previously, he had had a retinal detachment and it was actually repaired by one of the retinal surgeons in my practice. And I said, well, let's, let's take a look. We wanna make sure you don't have a, another retinal detachment. And he said, oh no, I'm, I'm in Chicago. That was about 500 miles away from where I live. And so the, um, uh, I said, well, come back, come in tomorrow morning. And he, sure enough, he came back the next day and he saw one of our, uh, not me, but one of the urgent specialists. And the urgent specialist um, called me late, late in the afternoon and said, hey, I've got this patient. And he's, he's 20, 20, six, six in one in his right eye, but in the eye in question, he's only counting fingers. There's no relative afferent pupillary defect but the retina looks fine and he had a retinal detachment. I said, oh, I think I talked to this guy last night. And he said, but the fundus looks normal. So I want, could you please take a look at him? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to, but I assume you probably dilated his pupils. And he said, well, of course. And I said, well, I won't look at him today. I will look at him tomorrow. Why? Because he's said to have no relative afferent pupillary defect and be count fingers. Well, you can't have an optic neuropathy in, in one eye and be counting fingers and have no, in the other eye, normal and have no relative afferent pupillary defects. So the next day he came in and my resident saw him first and, and the resident came out of the room and said, it's funny, um, the patient, you know, he's, his, his vision is counting fingers, but when he tilts his head, he says things get better. I said, it gets better. He said, I said, well, how good? And he said, uh, well, it gets, he goes from 20, from counting fingers to about 20, 40 when he tilts his head. That's odd. And I said, well, what else about the exam? He said, well, nothing really. I mean, everything looks normal. His media looks very clear. In fact, really clear. In fact, there was a note from the doctor from the day before commenting on how nice and clear his media looks. And I said, well, he's tilting his head. So why don't you take a look in the slit lamp and see what happens when he tilts his head. And here he is, he's tilting his head. So he, of course he had a, a posterior chamber IOL related to his retinal detachment surgery and the cataract the lens was removed. And what happens is his IOL is rotated out of position, but when he tilts his head, it rotates back up and he sees through the, the edge of it and he's 20, 40. And so this is another media problem. And with a plus 11 lens, he saw pretty well. Uh, so of course I called my anterior segment urgent care doctor and told him about the case. And I said, hey, I'm gonna use this in a lecture. He said, well, just don't tell him who saw the patient. Um, and then there are a couple of questions I see the, on the Q&A for what was the previous diagnosis. The, the, so the diagnosis, the patient had an oil droplet cataract. He had a dense central nucleus that was not very cloudy, but it was bending light funny. And that's that was the problem. And he actually, um, I sent him for cataract surgery and I got a note from him a couple of months later. And he said, thanks so much for sending me for that cataract surgery. My vision is great. And I'm drinking that one vodka martini per day. That was the, pre, that was the dentist, the drinking dentist. It really was not an, an optic neuropathy at all. So the worried traveler had a lens that had shifted out of place and they went in of course, and just put the lens and, and secured it in normal position. So 
the summary for media and refractive, I say these are the easy ones, but they're often missed. So don't forget about some of the simple things we have, pinhole testing, retinoscopy, color vision, direct ophthalmoscopy. Some of these things are very simple and help you sort this out. So, okay, let's say you've done this and you've decided um, that uh, it's not media refractive. Let's move on to retina and choroid. <clears throat> so I think the history is important for retina and choroid. I mean, history is always important, but in particular, if patients complain of distortion, vertical lines or horizontal lines look crooked, they're broken up, this is, these are terms used for, to describe metamorphopsia. This is almost always macular, almost always macular. Neurologic problems typically just don't uh, cause metamorphopsia. And then tiny central scotomas are often retinal, but I think the, the, the uh, crooked and metamorphopsia, that kind of history is gonna make you super suspicious. There's something going on with the retina. And of course, there should be no or a very small APD if it's really occult retinal. Of course, if you have a, re a central retinal artery occlusion, you have a big retinal attachment, of course, there's going to be an APD, but it's not going to be unexplained. You're going to look and say, yeah, there's the problem. So if it's occult retinal disease, there, there's usually no APD, maybe a small one. The Amsler grid can be helpful, right? This is just a form of perimetry. Uh, so the Amsler grid can be helpful to sort things out. And then, of course, we've got tons of ancillary studies, the fluorescenes and OCTs and ERGs. I'm not, this is, you know, the top could be the topic of three more Orbis webinars. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about any of those things. But let's just talk about a couple of cases. This is a woman who um, had a colonoscopy and she woke up from the colonoscopy and she was kind of seeing stars. And then she sort of checked her vision and she said, geez, my peripheral vision is not very good. She had a history of hypertension that was treated and lung cancer about five years previously also was treated. And that was it. And she, her central vision was pretty good, 20-25 or 6, 7.5. Her color vision was normal. Pupils were moderately active with no relative afferent pupillary defect. And slowly enough, I thought there maybe was a little rare anterior vitreal cell. Her visual fields look like this, so non-specific, but certainly meeting what she was complaining about, and that was constriction of her visual fields. She was quite convinced that somehow that colonoscopy caused her to have this visual problem. And on fundoscopy, she looked like this, so she's got big cups, but she also has big nerves, so these to me look very much like physiologic cups. Of course, um, if this were glaucoma, she's got a lot of nice, healthy pink rim, and you would not see that degree of visual field loss in glaucoma if this were glaucoma, but it was not glaucoma. This is just her baseline uh, visual fields. She had an MRI because the doctor seeing her couldn't find a problem, and the MRI was normal. Now is well, what's the next step? And the next step, I'll let you think about that briefly. And while you're thinking about that, summer, could you summarize the difference between HRR and Ishihara plates? The difference is simply that the HRR plates are a little more sensitive. So if someone had six, nine vision, I would choose the HRR color plates because they're harder, they're tougher. Um, if, if they're, if they're bet, if their vision's worse than 6, 12 or 20, 40, I'm going to, I don't care which ones I use. So what is the next step? Some of you probably know the next step was an ERG and it was flat. So the ERG response was terrible and her diagnosis was cancer associated retinopathy. So this is a perineoplastic process where your body generates a re an immune response against the cancer, although she thought she was cured, she wasn't, uh, against the cancer. And sometimes that response will attack the retina with these anti-recovering antibodies. So people often have rapid peripheral field loss before they have central field loss. They have positive visual phenomenon. So if you 
hear the story of flashing lights and constricted fields. Um, ring scotomas can be seen very early. She does not have ring scotomas because it went a little bit further than that. Um, you may see a little anterior vitreal cell or retinal vascular attenuation, but not necessarily early on. And the ERG is the test. So cancer associated retinopathy. A good friend of mine, Andy Lee, who I know has done a fairly recent Orbis webinar, um, a, a neuro-ophthalmologist and actually my former medical student, uh, his first rule of unexplained vision loss is, if it's referred by retina, it's always retinal. And of course that's kidding a little bit. All right, so we've talked about retina and choroid. We've got lots of tests. The other thing to say about it, when OCT came around, it eliminated a lot of my referrals to retina to look at their macula. Now I just get the OCT. And then optic nerve and visual pathway. So of course, that's what I thought I'd be doing as a neuro-ophthalmologist, looking at these types of problems. So as a neuro-ophthalmologist, of course, I have to emphasize the importance of the relative afferent pupillary defect, probably the most critical and objective test in ophthalmology, but underemphasized, or at least in neuro-ophthalmology. And as you all know, you don't need much to test it. You need a darker room. You need a bright light, two eyes. You only need one pupil that works. And don't forget to have the patient fixate at distance. Don't let them look anywhere they want to look. And you can see here an obvious, this would be a very obvious right relative afferent pupillary defect. And don't forget the secret weapon, our color vision testing, HRR or Ishihara. And we have all sorts of ways to test peripheral vision. Goldman perimetry, which is something that I must admit, I personally have not obtained Goldman perimetry in about 20 years and don't plan on it. Um, automated perimetry, and, and these are uh, Humphrey programs. I, I have no financial interest in Humphrey. In the United States, at least, the predominant field analyzer is Humphrey, and the programs are 24-2, These are looking at the 24 degrees, 30 degrees. We have the 10-2 looking centrally at just the central 10 degrees. And then don't forget Amsler grid, as I mentioned. Amsler grid really is a form of perimetry. So we have all sorts of things that we can use to sort out nerve and visual pathway problems. So let's look at a couple of cases. Here's the first one. So this is a, a patient. I've never seen this patient. I was called by their ophthalmologist, as often happens. And I said, hey, I've got this patient of mine. Um, did her cataract surgery a long time ago. Um, I'm following her just for some dry macular degeneration. And I saw her some months ago for her routine annual exam. Everything was good. And she called me this morning and said, hey, since yesterday, I'm having trouble reading. Since yesterday. She has high blood pressure that's under control. She was 2020 or 66 at distance and at near. Color vision normal. Visual fields full to confrontation. Slit lamp exam showed the same well positioned posterior chamber intraocular lenses. But the fundus had just the same drusen that we'd seen before. And he said, and I know you wouldn't, you would want more information than that. And right on cue, my assistant walked into the room and said, oh, Dr. So-and-so just faxed the visual fields. And here are her Humphrey 24-2 visual fields. So the question uh, here is, what is going on? So she can't read. So when someone tells me they can't read, uh, there's, there, there's one really important question. And the question is, what do you mean you can't read? And I said to the, I was on the phone with the doctor and I said, well, is the patient there? She, she's sitting right here. And I said, okay, we'll ask her. What is she? And he said, ma'am, what do you mean you, you can't read? She said, well, when I look at the, the, the words in the book, I can only see part of the word. I don't see the whole word. Huh. So she has a scotoma, right? She has some kind of small scotoma, but she can't see part of the word with both eyes open, what does that tell you? It tells you a couple things, right? Number one, if she were blind in one eye, she would see the whole word with the other eye, right? So she's gotta have 
bilateral, right? Bilateral small central or small scotomas. In not only that, but if you had a scotoma in one eye in one place and in the other eye in another place, you'd still be able to see the whole word. So it tells you not only does she have a scotoma in both eyes, it has to be in exactly the same place in both eyes. But wait a minute, look at the fields. There's no scotoma there near the center. So what's the problem? What do we do? Well, I told them, listen, thanks for doing this automated perimetry, but you did the wrong test. You did the wrong program. You should have done a 10-2. And here's the 10 to. So there's a difference. The difference between the 10 to and the 24 to is not just the number of degrees. It's that a 10 to has a tighter stimulus density, right? So there's a point, a point every two degrees, whereas in a 24 to, it's every six. So if you have small scotoma that fits within the density of the shown stimuli, you could miss, as was in this case, you could miss a scotoma. And look at that. She has a scotoma that goes right up to center in both eyes in the same place. And what did I tell the ophthalmologist? This was sudden yesterday in an elderly woman. I said, she had a stroke. She needs an MRI. So this I would describe as a left superior paracentral homonymous hemianopic scotoma. And I said she had a stroke in the very, very back of her right occipital lobe, just below the calcarine fissure. And he said, I'll get an MRI. And I said, good. And then send me the results because this will be a good case for my talks. And here's her MRI showing that occipital tip stroke, just as we would expect given her visual fields. Um, there's another question in the box about the difference between 30-2 and 24-2. For, for neuro op patients, the only difference is the 30-2 takes longer. And so I never do 30-2s, I only do 24-2s. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next case. Let me just look at the, uh, the chat here. Um, could photo stress testing substitute for EAG and cancer associated retinopathy? Right so um, photo stress test, it could help. And that the idea behind that is that if you have a retinal problem, then your acuity won't recover. The problem is, remember that early or midway through the perineoplastic, the cancer associated with that, you don't have a problem with central vision. So I suspect the photo stress test would not be adequate. Um, is perineoplastic syndrome more common in small cell carcinomas? Yes, um, that's the most common type of cancer, small cell lung cancer. All right, we're gonna move on to another, another case. So this is also an older 71 year old gentleman who also complains of difficulty reading, but for the last four months, not for not since yesterday, but it's been four months. He comes in uh, with his wife and he's seen three doctors and he has a brown paper bag and I'm hoping it's his lunch, but he dumps it on my table and there are five pairs of glasses. And he said, I've seen all these doctors over this time. I've got all these pairs of glasses and not one of them helps me read. I said, well, is there anything else going on? And he said, no. And his wife said, well, he seems a little more clumsy than usual, but other than that, no. And on exam, 6-6 OU at distance and near. And with these patients, with this problem that we'll get to, I often scoot my chair over to the family members and say, with my near card, say, he just read that line at the bottom. And they look at the, they look at the near card and they say, I can't read that line. Why can't he read? And he had already had a 24-2 and a 10-2 that were normal. Everything looked normal. Fundus was normal, everything was normal. So what do we do? Well, for those of you who are listening to the presentation, the first question I ask when someone says I can't read is why not? What do you mean you can't read? And he said, well, I don't really know. I mean, I can see the letters and everything. I can sort of see the words, but, and I said, well, and I gave him a magazine. And I said, read. And he started to read. <clears throat> and he read the, the first sentence. And he started the second sentence. And he stopped. And then he kind of looked at me. And then he went back. And he started reading at the beginning again. And then he read a little more. But then he skipped a sentence. And I said, aha, I think I know what's going on here. I'm not sure anyone else in the audience knows. 
So I said, well, let's try one other test. And I showed him this. So this is readily available online from the Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Examination. And you simply have an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and you, with this on it, and you give it to the patient. And you say, what do you see on this picture? And he said, well, I see a woman and she's washing the, uh, the, the dish. And I said, okay, is it anything else? And he said, uh, nope. I said, you don't see anything else? No. And with my finger, I pointed over here at the sink and, I, and he said, oh, he said, yeah. He said, that sink, look at it, it's overflowing and get onto the floor. And I said, yeah, any, anything else? No, nothing else. And I said, well, what, what about, a? oh, there's a kid uh, uh, taking a cookie. So the point is he was only seeing one thing in this picture. We call that simultanagnosia, simultanagnosia. And he had the visual variant of Alzheimer's disease, also known as posterior cortical atrophy. And this is a problem um, of visual processing. And once you start talking to the family about this is not a, a seeing problem, this is a processing problem. And the family's all shaking their head. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. You know, there are other things. His memory may be not be quite as good. There are other things going on that they, 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 they usually very quickly grasp what is happening. And that is, there's some degree of early dementia that happens to be affecting vision and vision processing more than memory. So reading difficulties, 90% of these patients have reading difficulties. About two thirds have simultanagnosia where they'll just see one thing, not more than one. Spatial disorientation, ocular apraxia, sometimes these people will say, yeah, when I, when, sometimes when he's reaching for his, his water glass, when he's eating, he'll, he'll bump it and knock it over even. And it's one of the very few things that can cause homonymous visual field defects with relatively normal MRIs. These usually aren't dense homonymous amniopsies, but they'll they'll he can present with field defects that look homonymous, and yet the MRI is normal, and they get to me for that reason. So unexplained vision loss, brain or optic nerve. Did you miss a relative afferent pupillary defect? Is the color vision normal? Did I do the correct visual field? Or could there be some sort of diffuse cerebral dysfunction? All right, so you've done your exam. You've checked, you said, I don't think it's refractive media. I've looked at the retina and the choroid. I've done the OCT, whatever else I need to have done. I've done them. Nope, it's not retina and choroid. I've looked for that APD color vision fields. I don't think it's optic nerve or visual pathway. Well, what have you got left? Well. Unfortunately, not all patients with vision loss or vision problems have quote unquote real visual loss. And that's where this term non-organic comes in. So let's start with a patient, 28 year old woman who has poor vision last night, in the, sorry, poor vision in the left eye since being kicked in the eye in a bar fight. She was in a fight the night before and she called one of my partners who, whose patient she was, um, and her past ocular history, he'd been following her for HLA B27 uveitis. She has mild macular edema. That's just kind of, you can't really get rid of it. She's 20, 40 or 6, 12. And that's her kind of what her baseline is over the last year or so. And that's, that's where she was. So she called him early in the morning and said, oh, I can't see out of my left. I got kicked last night. And he said, well, come in, let me take a look. And so he found that her right eye was baseline at 2040 or 612, but her left eye was now counting fingers. He said, well, and he came down the hallway to talk to me in his scrubs because he was going to the operating theater. And he said, hey, he said, I got this patient. He told me about her and she's counting fingers in the one eye, her other eye's baseline, but there's no relative afferent pupillary defect. But I didn't dilate her because I know you wouldn't trust me. But I did look at her fundus and I, I had a clear view and I could see her macula at least, and her maculas looked like they, they did, you know, two months ago when I saw her for her chronic mild macular edema. And I said, oh, well, and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, let me grab something from my office and then I'll come down and take a look at her. And the question that I'll ask you later is, what did I take from my office? So that's the, that's the, the case. We'll come back to this case in a bit. 
So non-organic, non-organic is a term I prefer. Malingering or faking, um, or what's the other word people use? Um, functional, I don't like any of those words. Um, malingering is a psychiatric diagnosis. It means someone's doing faking vision loss on purpose to get something. Now, the majority of my patients with non-organic vision loss are malingering, but I am not a psychiatrist. I, do, I don't like to make psychiatric diagnoses. I feel like a psychiatrist sometimes, however. And then there are other psychiatric diagnoses. So Munchausen's, factitious, this is intentional because the patient likes um, medical attention. I know, don't ask me, that's weird. Conversion disorder. So this is something where, for instance, a soldier at war has a, um, a, a flesh wound in the shoulder, but they can't walk. And they're not really doing it on purpose, but they, their subconscious does not want to go back to war. Um, that's a conversion disorder. And then hypochondriac exaggerate. So non-organic encompasses all of these things. And there are different common presentations of non-organic. I'm gonna talk briefly about four. Unilateral or asymmetric visual acuity loss. Thankfully, this in my experience is by far the most common type of non-organic vision problem I see. Unilateral or asymmetric. Bilateral visual acuity loss, tunnel vision, where they can see centrally, but they can't see anything to the sides. And then unilateral temporal hemifield, that's not very common. So unilateral visual loss, what can we do? Well, you can start with really tiny letters. Um, patients don't know how big the letters are. If you have electronic, an electronic uh, visual acuity chart, of course, it's much easier to do it. And my technician who's very cynical will show them like the 2015 or six, six four point five line, and then she'll show another six, four point five, and then she'll show a six, six. And by the time she's up to like, six, 7.5, she showed him six lines and the patient's thinking, boy, these are, must be getting big. She showed me like six lines, maybe I'll start seeing them. There's the DKR, the doctor killing refraction. It takes so long, either you die or they die. Gradual fogging in the foropter. So you can put plus lenses up, but the, if the patient's at all with it, they can simply close one eye, close the other eye behind the foropter and they'll understand what you're doing. Stereopsis is good if they have a problem with near vision because you need good vision in both eyes to have good stereopsis. But then by far my favorite is the vertical prism test. And I think if you get one thing out of this entire webinar, this is worth its weight in gold. So here's the vertical prism test. You simply get, get check their best corrected vision <clears throat> and you then put up a letter that's a little bit bigger than their best corrected vision in their good eye. So if they're 6'6 six, six or 20, 20, you might put up a 6'12 letter, single letter. And then you simply hold a prism vertically, a four prism diopter prism vertically in front of the good eye. And the patient's thinking, okay, what am I gonna say when he holds it in front of my bad eye? But you hold it in front of the good eye. Now, what will the patient see when you do that? Well, if their vision is real, if it's really bad, they'll see this. They'll see the good eye, they'll see one clear letter. With the bad eye, they'll either see nothing, depending on how bad their vision is, or they'll see some blurry thing below it or above it, depending on which way you hold the prism, right? But if they're non-organic, they'll see two, one above the other, right? And they don't get that. They don't get that. So... This is a really simple and quick test. If they, so what I do is I put up the prism. I say, what do you see? Sometimes they say, well, uh, I say, well, do you see two? Yes, I see two. Is one, one above the other, right? Yes, one above the other. And then the critical question is, are they about the same clarity? Yes. What did, that, what did they just tell you? My vision's the same in each eye because they don't understand they're seeing one of the letters with their good eye and one of the letters with their bad eye. And then sometimes you take the prism away and then say, well, aren't you gonna check my other eye? Uh, not today. So if they see two letters, you got them. It has to be, it has to be non-organic. If they see one letter though, for let's say they see one letter. Well, now I'm a believer and there are definitely patients I see who I think are non-organic. And I do this test and they give me the correct response. And I think, oh, 
really, you see only one? Uh, and then I really have to look hard for the reason that they can't see. So what about our patient? 20, 40 and counting fingers. What did I grab when I walked out of the office to go, to go check her out? I grabbed a four prism diopter prism. Remember, if the vision is bad in one eye, they'll see this. If the vision is good in both eyes, they'll see this. She saw two layers of the same clarity. My uh, interior segment colleague said to me, I know that means something. And I said, let's go out in the hallway and talk. And we talked and we reassured, 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 don't worry, you'll get better and sent her on her way. Here's another patient with asymmetric vision loss. So it wasn't normal in either eye. He was 2060 or 618, um, 672 in the other eye. And the retina specialist who referred the patient said, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I said, why? And he said, well, I, I don't, this guy has unexplained vision loss and, um, you know, no APD, slit lamp, his fundus, retina is normal. Um, and when, I, when he came out to make the appointment with you, he pulled out his pocket calendar and um, made the appointment. So he must be faking. And I said, well, all right, let's take a look. So, sorry, his exam was, as I mentioned, and his visual field looked like this. And I thought, well, that's interesting. That's usually not what I see with someone who's non-organic. It's usually black or it's really constricted, even though they have central loss of vision. So what do we do with this guy? He's already seen the retina specialist. That's a hint. Um, so I said, gee, something's going on. So we did a vertical prism test. And indeed, he saw one letter. So he was not, he was real. So we did a multifocal ERG, and this is something that I'm sure many of you probably don't have the ability to obtain, but the multifocal ERG should have a nice peak in the fovea like this, the normal reference, and neither of his multifocal ERGs had that peak. So this was a form of cone dystrophy, and I sent him right back to the retina specialist. So vertical prism test, super simple, and probably you'll have a four prism diopter prism. What about bilateral visual acuity? Well, that's tougher, uh, depending on how bad the vision is. You can observe their ambulation, you know, an obstacle course or walking through the room. Sunglasses, interestingly, at least in the United States, are a red flag. This QR code will take you to an article from the Emory Group where it showed that if a person comes into your room with sunglasses on in a dark room, there's a high positive probability that they're non-organic. And then the optokinetic drum can be used. If you have one of these, I think there's also, you know, phone apps with OKN drums or strips. You got to spin it slowly, not fast like this. You got to spin it slow and then watch their eyes move because it's hard for them not to move their eyes when those stripes go by. Remember, this doesn't tell you their vision is normal. It just tells you that they can see those stripes. So the first question is when you show them the stripes is, can you see black and white stripes? And if they say yes, well, then put it away. And you can start with the tiny letters. You can do the doctor killing refraction. You can threaten them with electrophysiology. Hey, we've got a, a test, a pattern, a VEP that can tell us about what your vision is. You don't have to say anything. We can measure it. So there are other things you can do for bilateral vision loss. For tunnel vision, there's the classic woman with, my, I can only see straight ahead. My vision's fine right straight ahead, but it's really constricted. And sure enough, on automated perimetry, she does this in both eyes, which you know anybody can do that on the test if they want. And it's the old tunnel versus funnel field. Patients don't understand that if they have a constricted field, if you're twice as far away from them, the field will be twice as big. It doesn't do this. It doesn't tunnel. It's normal vision. No matter how constricted your field, it expands as the distance gets further away. And so I usually just check their confrontation fields at <clears throat> one meter and then scoot my chair across the room and check it at two or three meters. And if it's exactly the same as one meter, you know that it's non-organic. And here's a tangent screen demonstration. At one meter, it's this big. At two meters, it should double. If it doesn't, as in C here, it's non-organic. And then finally, a rarer thing, which I don't want to belabor the point, but unilateral temporal hemi field. Here's a patient who had an injury at work and 
um, had a, a problem with vision in the right eye. He couldn't see off to the right. That was his complaint. He saw an ophthalmologist. The exam was normal. He got an MRI. The MRI was normal and sent the patient to me. Uh, we repeated the fields. They looked like this. And I said, well, that's rather odd. I, I'm sorry. I just want to do this test one more time because I think this is non-organic. Wait a minute. Non that's pretty good. He's right up and down the midline. Anybody can do that. You just don't beep when it's on to the right of the midline. And so I said, we're going to do one more test. We're going to do the test. Just, just bear with me. And I tell my technician, all right, leave both eyes open and center them right on the nose instead of right on the pupil. And here's what he did. So when he was blind in the right eye, right, he put a patch on his eye to do this eye. He had a normal field. Now you leave both eyes open and he does this. He has to be purposely not beeping. Has to be. And then my last case is the 60-year-old gentleman who complains of poor vision since childhood. No changes have been noted. He has a history of hypertension that's controlled, but a very uh, um, important, perhaps, social history. He recently was released from prison after 25 years in prison. And he was hand motioned in both eyes. His pupils were briskly reactive and there was no relative afferent pupillary defect. He could see motion in all quadrants. And he was referred by a retina specialist because he, was, he went sent to the retina specialist because of this problem. His fundus was normal. He already had an ERG that was normal. And the retina specialist said, yeah, please take a look at this patient. I said, well, gee, do you, do you think maybe he's faking? And he said, oh, no, no, he's got a cane. And I said, oh, okay. So what do we do? Well, he's hand motions OU. So we quickly just threw up the OKN drum and his eyes moved. But that doesn't prove he's normal, right? I mean, you can have pretty bad vision. You could be legally blind and have a positive OKN response. So clearly he's not really being truthful because his, his vision, if he really were hand motion, he would not be able to see those stripes going, going by. So <clears throat> I said, well, is this, first of all, is this exam possible? Can you be hand motion in both eyes with brisk pupils, no APD, and a normal eye exam? And the answer is yes, you can. If I remove or severely damage both of your eyes, occipital lobes, right? You'll have brisk pupils. You'll have terrible vision metrically in both eyes. And I said, well, you need an MRI to be sure nothing is going on in the brain. He said, I had an MRI in prison. And I said, well, we need the MRI. So we had him sign a record release in the United States. You have to do that. He signed it. We sent it to the prison. And they said, no, no, you need a special records release, special one from us. We'll fax it to you. So we had to call the patient to come back in and sign the prison record release. And he came back in and um, while, he was, while he was there, um, he, my assistant, the cynical one, um, watched him and watched him leave the building from the second floor window. And he walked with his cane and his girlfriend over to their car. He put the cane in his pocket and got in the driver's seat and drove away. <laughs> And my assistant said, oh, great, Dr. Golnick's going to get this guy. Um, and she then she started thinking about, well, why was he in prison for 25 years? And her neighbor was a policeman. And he said, oh, you can find out. It's public record in the United States. Just go to this website. And she did. And first degree murder, second degree murder. And then she got worried. And she said, oh, my gosh. She said, wait a minute, he, he, maybe he's not happy being out of prison. Maybe he wants to go back to prison, but what are you gonna do? And I said, well, what does he want? And she said, well, he, wants that, he wanted that handicapped parking sticker, which allows people to park in special places near the stores. And I said, done, and I never saw him again. And that was it for him. So in summary for unexplained vision loss, the first question is, and I tell my patients this sometimes, we got to figure out where is the problem. Use common tools, color vision, direct ophthalmoscopy to figure out, is this media refractive? Get the correct visual field test. 
But you want to prove it's non-organic. It's not enough to think it's non-organic. You want to prove it. And the vertical prism test, if they have asymmetric or unilateral loss of vision, is a great way to do it. And I think with that, I'm going to just, I had a couple other slides here. I'm going to just briefly mention, and that is, there is a new international group called the Ophthalmology Foundation. And the mission of our group, and I'm the director for education for this group, um, is to help ophthalmologists become better teachers and provide training opportunities through sponsoring fellowships. So most of the old ICO fellowships are now part of the Ophthalmology Foundation in collaboration with the International Ophthalmological Fellowship Foundation. We have about 100 fellowships slash observerships a year, 100. And these are for people in general under the age of 40, quote unquote, young ophthalmologists. And they're all over the, available all over the world. You have to apply for them. Um, but that's one of our initiatives. The other is faculty development, improving the training ability of ophthalmic educators. So I just want everyone to have that on their radar. This is a new group. This is not the ICO. This is not a United States group. This is an international group. Uh, and I'm, I'm a director for education of this group. And there's an, a, found a, a website that's simply ophthalmologyfoundation.org if you're interested in learning more. Okay, so that's what I have to say about unexplained vision loss. And what I'm going to do is look back through the Q&A. Uh, someone commented subclinical keratoconus and lenticonus are other common causes of unexplained vision loss. Very true. So keratoconus in my uh, limited refractive world would be early care is going to give you irregular astigmatism, right, that you can't correct early on, um, and posterior lenticonus. Um, there is someone that said question, the HCQ question, I'm not really sure what that means. Um, is there a role of medication and chemotherapy in accelerating the vision loss? Uh, I'm assuming that's related to the perineoplastic phenomenon, and the answer is hopefully not. Hopefully that will help. You want to try to find a cancer if you think it's perineoplastic. You want to try to find a cancer and treat it. Um, Drusen, can we diagnose through direct ophthalmoscope? Sure. I mean, if you're, I'm not sure which type of Drusen you mean, but optic disc Drusen and macular Drusen can be diagnosed with a direct ophthalmoscope. The problem is if you have buried disc Drusen, then it can be. Uh, then it may not be able to be diagnosed with uh, a direct ophthalmoscope. You might need autofluorescence, uh, B-scan ultrasonography, OCT can look at Drewis, Drusen. Um, is CRAOH have any rule? I don't know. I don't know what CRAOH is. Um, seeing problem versus processing, right? So that simply means that the visual path, if, it, if it's a processing problem, primarily, the visual pathways are intact. It's a question of seeing, as, as I tell them, it's a lot more than just seeing something. You've got to be able to see it and then understand what it is. And reading is a very complex task. It's not just, I see that letter, right? You've got to make that letters into a word, the word into a sentence. You've got to remember what you just read. You've got to be able to follow your place along the page. Uh, so that's the difference. <clears throat> oh, sorry, SLE, slit lamp examination. I'll remember that to spell it out. Um, how's the patient counseling after patient? Ah, so that's a good question about what do you tell patients who have non-organic vision loss? So what I tell them, it depends a little on the situation. The first thing I tell them, and the more family members in the room, the better, right? I tell them, great news. Your exam is normal, and the testing I've done indicates this is clearly not a permanent problem. In fact, you could be better tomorrow or in the next few days, a week even, but I know, and I look them right in the eye because because they're better right now, I know this is going to get better. And the family says, oh, thank goodness, we're at the doctor, the specialist, and he says you're going to be okay. What can the patient say? No, I'm not. Um, so that's what I tell them. So I try to reassure them. Now, if in the United States, sometimes they'll say, oh, well, that's fine, but you know, I can't see now. And so here's my disability paperwork, or here's my lawyer's information, because this happened when I got hit in the head with a box or something. Then I show them how I busted them. 
And I say, listen, here's, here's what I did. And I have proved without a shadow of a doubt that your vision is fine in that eye. Your brain might be playing tricks on your eyes and we can have you see a psychiatrist, not because you're crazy, but because this could be a subconscious problem. And the type of doctor who deals with subconscious problems is a psychiatrist. And I give them that option. Um, consistent eyelid twitching. Well, I'm not sure if that's a question or not. Um, I'm, I've never seen someone who was non-organic with consistent eyelid twitching. Certainly consistent eyelid twitching can be uh, benign essential blepharospasm or hemifacial spasm if it's only one-sided. Um, can, can you please give a little brief, brief about AMD? I assume you mean macular degeneration. The answer is no, I won't. I'm not a retina specialist. I do not treat or take care of AMD. And that's at least one or two webinars worth of a topic. Um, kindly brief or for contrast. Oh, oh, so the question is with MRIs, I never, I won't say never, I extremely rarely order an MRI without contrast, a brain MRI. I always order it with, with and without contrast unless there's a contraindication to the contrast. Always, because you will miss things if you don't get it. And I see patients relatively frequently where their family doctor orders an MRI without contrast, normal. So look, we're looking for inflammation. We're looking for optic neuritis. We're looking for a small brain tumor. You are not going to see it unless you give contrast. So the answer is, I virtually never order an MRI without contrast. Um, has the OCT ganglion cell exam have a role in your clinic? Uh, yes, um, it does. An increasing role. Now, I'm a very old neuro-ophthalmologist and a dinosaur, we would say, in the world of OCT. I'm learning more about OCT. I, I definitely do OCTs, and I think they can be very helpful. A ganglion cell layer um, can be abnormal in and it surprises me sometimes how normal the rest of the eye exam is. Probably the, the, the classic example, at least in the United States, would be in a patient with multiple sclerosis who maybe had some visual blurring a while ago, but now their vision is pretty normal. And you really don't find much. And lo and behold, the ganglion cell layer is thin. And I'm like, wow, that is a really sensitive test. I think that there are issues sometimes with artifacts on OCTs. And that's what I'm trying to sort through is, when, am I really sure about the result of the OCT when I get it? Um, give the full, okay. So, sorry, I shouldn't use radiation. So SLE, I mentioned slit lamp exam and POH past ocular history. Sorry, I'll fix those slides. What do you mean by doctor killing refraction? Well, I'm kidding, sort of. It means that the refraction is so long, it takes so much time that you feel like dying or the patient will just give up and then maybe they'll cooperate. Um, that, that's what I mean by doctor. It's, a, it's, a, it's supposed to be a joke. What about conversion spasm and asthenopsia? I don't know, that's not irrelevant to this topic, I think. Um, but yeah, people get conversion spasm and asthenopia. That's a whole nother topic. If we are suspecting neurological causes, should we go for 32 or 24-2 or 60-4? Um, I always do a 24-2. That's my standard automated perimeter. Now, if the patient has a small central field problem, I'm going to get a 10 to. If the patient has says, no, it's way outside my peripheral vision, then a 60-4. But I virtually never get a 30-2. The only time I get a 30-2 is if the patient has previous 30-2s from other doctors, and I want to make a really direct comparison of something that I'm concerned may be changing over time. How to rule out malingerer? Well, hopefully that my, the whole last part of my talk was about that. Um, I'm not sure if that's the answer to that question, but that was the whole last 15 to 20 minutes of this webinar was how to rule out malingerer. If you mean malingerer versus a psychiatric, other a, a different psychiatric diagnosis, I send them to a psychiatrist. Um, what's the difference between organic and non-organic? So non-organic simply means there's nothing wrong with their visual system. There's no organic problem. Organic means there's something going on. And, and most of the things that we talked about today where doctors referred patients with, I don't see anything wrong. 
we, we ultimately did find organic things. So organic things, an oil droplet cataract, irregular astigmatism, uh, cone dystrophy, um, uh, visual variant of Alzheimer's disease, all of those things are organic. There's something actually wrong with the visual system. Whereas non-organic means there isn't. It is one of those other entities, malingering, conversion disorder, et cetera. Can someone on medication complain of unexplained vision loss? Anybody in the world can explain, complain of unexplained, unexplained vision loss, no matter what, who they are, what they're, uh, you know, I, I definitely at times when my resident says, see this patient, I don't think they would be, they'd be faking. And I said, I don't care what, they, what, what their, you know, age, what their socioeconomic class is. I don't care what it is. Um, I, I definitely see people where I think, I don't, I don't know why they're, non-organic, but they are. Um, did the patient with unilateral temporal hemianopsia truly have, oops, uh, hold on a minute. Did the patient with unilateral temporal hemianopsia truly have a non-organic issue? Yes. How does the expansion of the temporal field allows to rule out a non-organic issue? So the, 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 the thing about the test, think about it. When you do automated perimetry, you cover each eye in turn, right? And in that patient, when we did automated perimetry with the bad eye closed, with it patched, there was a normal visual field, right? When we close the, patch the good eye and just do the bad eye, you see this temporal defect. But then with both eyes open, the patient also produces a temporal defect. Well, wait a minute, with, one, with that eye blind, he didn't have a temporal defect. So the patient doesn't understand that the visual fields overlap. And so when you do, if you do the fields both eyes open and the person is blind in the right eye, the field should look normal. That's what it did look like, right? When we did it the first time, we blinded the right eye with a patch and the field was normal. Now you have both eyes open and there's a temp, how can that be? Only if the patient's purposely not beeping. So I, I hope that makes sense. Lawyers don't get that usually. I just tell them, trust me, they're faking. Um, I have a patient with keratoconus nerve drusen and glaucoma. <laughs> That's tough. That's a really tough problem. We gave a course many years ago at the Academy on how to sort you know, glaucoma from neurologic things out. There is virtually no way to sort that out. Um, I, what, what, so what do you do if you can't sort it out? Because if you've got glaucoma and you've got drusen, well, you're probably not gonna see increased cupping because the drusen are filling in all the space. Um, I think you've got to treat them for glaucoma as best you can without harming them and hope that their fields don't get worse. The problem is with drusen, as you're sort of implying, drusen can cause gradual peripheral field loss, uh, as does glaucoma. So it's a very tough question. All I can tell you is there's no treatment for drusen. There is treatment for glaucoma, lower the pressure, and follow their fields. Um, what a field loss associated with migraine? Will it be non-organic? Um, well, so I guess the answer to that is during the migraine, it's organic, right? There's something going on in the brain. But when the migraine's over, the vast majority, it's rare to see a permanent field defect from migraine, although you can, and it amounts to a stroke, um, then it's organic. How about amaurosis fugax? Well, amaurosis fugax is organic, right? I mean, usually the, when we think about amaurosis fugax, we think about a, a retinal emboli. Um, um, and so that's organic, but of course, amaurosis fugex means fleeting loss of vision. So theoretically, when you see them, they won't, they will be, have a normal exam, um, but it was, it's, I wouldn't call it non-organic. It's, it's typically a retinal emboli. Uh, contrast is very helpful. T1 fat suppressed, T1 fat saturated post-contrast, axial chronal are the best views. Uh, I would say that's true. Um, do, oops, do, do you do perimeter routinely for bilateral disc swelling, pavlima? Yes. So in my patients and in my world, idiopathic intracranial hypertension is by far the most common uh, condition I see of any condition. Um, and in general, every patient gets a visual field every time I see them until we have fixed their papilledema. Once we have gotten rid of the papilledema, they're no, no longer at risk, no matter what their pressure is. They're no longer at risk once the papilledema is gone, and then I don't get 
visual fields any longer. But until their swelling is gone, they get a visual field when I see them. The patient with CAR post-colonoscopy, could it still have been post-perioperative ischemic optic neuropathy? Uh, and what would help us differentiate between the two? Um, well, that's an interesting question. So um, sure, we see people after procedures, sir, typically not something like, uh, of course, we, you would check, was this an uncomplicated colonoscopy? I mean, colonoscopies are pretty quick. It would be extremely rare, although the person could have an, a cardiac arrhythmia or something. So if the history had been, oh, the, we had to resuscitate this patient because she had an arrhythmia during colonoscopy, that's a whole other story. But yeah, that would be that would be tough. Now, the I think the, um, the flashing lights, and of course, ultimately the ERG will tell you the difference between the two, but I think, uh, clearly, I see a ton, not a ton, I see a fair amount of, you know, post-operative or post-procedural problems from um, problems from the procedure. I just saw the brother of one of our senior retina specialists who had a um, um, uh, a coronary um, arteriogram, coronary catheterization, and they, the procedure was uncomplicated. And he was changing back into his clothes and he realized that he couldn't see well to the left. And he had an occipital stroke um, from a, an uncomplicated, you know, quote unquote, uncomplicated uh, coronary catheterization. So definitely weird things can happen. I think if this really was a uncomplicated colonoscopy, then I, I you know, um, this ischemic optic neuropathy would not be on my list of possibilities. And it would be pretty rare. I mean, I see lots of ischemic optic neuropathies to have just bilateral symmetric constriction of the visual field. So um, how long should we observe delayed visual maturation? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I'm not a pediatric ophthalmologist and I don't do that stuff. Uh, is central retinal artery occlusion have any role in unexplained? No. Because if they have a central, well, they, if they have a central retinal artery occlusion acutely, you should see a central retinal artery occlusion picture. Now, if they have an old central retinal artery occlusion, the retina might look okay, but the nerve, if their vision's bad, the nerve should be pale and there should be a relative afferent pupillary defect. And that would, in my opinion, it would be unexplained in a sense. And you could then do an ERG to prove whether it's retina or whether it's a primary optic nerve problem. Um, in general though, if we see optic atrophy, because of course you can have optic atrophy from any optic nerve damage, but you can have optic atrophy from a, a bad retinal problem too. Um, we wrote a paper some years ago now, uh, I think Dr. Lee was one of our co-authors on unexplained vision loss, unexplained optic atrophy. And we had some, I think 97 patients in the paper and they all got imaged. And these are people who didn't have any obvious reason to have optic nerve damage. And more than 25% had tumors pushing on their optic nerve. So in general, if I see someone with optic atrophy, where there is no definite answer, they get an MRI with and without contrast. Um, but what stage do you operate on? Well, drop a cataract. As soon as it makes the person's vision bad enough. And that, of course, depends a lot on the patient and what they want to tolerate. A young boy coming in with excessive blinking with no obvious visual problems. Can this be non-organic? Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you from one dinosaur to another. I've seen lots of kids who wanted glasses. They all had tunnel vision. Readers of plus 0.5, right. Uh, <laughs> right, so sometimes kids want glasses. I don't know why. Why? I never wanted glasses when I was a kid. I don't want them when I'm an adult either. Um, but I don't know why. But you're right. Some kids just want glasses, um, and, and they they do that sort of a thing. Um, so interesting point. Uh, for malingering patients, especially knowledgeable patients, what single test is recommended? So it depends. Like we just talked about, what are they malingering? Right? And thankfully, most patients in my practice malinger bad vision in one eye, and the vertical prism test is beautiful. It's so simple and quick. Um, so. In that setting, clearly the vertical prism does. <clears throat> um, what could cause a patient to become very photophobic and start to have light flashes after dilation? Fundus appears slightly swollen. Uh, 
That's a tough, I don't know that I can answer that one. Fundus appears slightly swollen. I'm not sure if you mean the optic nerve or nerves appear slightly swollen. Um, I don't know. I, I, that, I mean, they, I'm not sure the answer to that question, I guess. Photo, I mean, presumably they, they're, they're not in angle closure, uh, glaucoma, uh, which wouldn't cause swelling, but I'm not sure about that. Please, what is DRG? Uh, I'm not sure what DRG is. I, I, I said ERG, but I'm not sure about DRG. Is sectoral optic atrophy always caused by a vascular problem? Oh, that's a good question. So certainly if I see sectoral superior or inferior optic atrophy, I'm thinking probably, probably old vascular, right? And if there's a history a documented by an eye doctor of swelling of the nerve, and then they send me the patient and the nerve swelling's gone and they have sectoral swelling, then I'm probably going to assume that was a, 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 an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. But if they just come in with sectoral optic atrophy, MRI with and without to look for something pushing on their nerve, I've seen sectoral optic atrophy with compressive lesions. <clears throat> Um, is cortical and occipital stroke always associated with retinal thinning? The answer is best we know, I think, is no, not always. And in fact, when I was in training and for decades until OCT came out, it was thought to never be associated with retinal thinning. But when OCT came out, we realized, I mean, because to get retinal thinning, you have to have transsynaptic degeneration. And we didn't, we used to think that that only could occur sort of in utero. And once you're born, you don't get transsynaptic degeneration, but OCT has shown that you can have transsynaptic degeneration. So I'm not sure, you know, it's one of those always things, never say always and never say never. Um, but the answer is you can see it with cortical and occipital damage, whether it's a stroke or anything else. For elder patients, uh, sudden blurring, significant vision loss, but nerve looks normal. Okay, workup only showed elevated sed rates here. No other abnormal findings, normal brain scan. Do you manage similar to GCA and manage with steroids? So the answer is, I think the answer is yes. Um, we, I mean, certainly if they have significant visual loss in one eye and a relative afferent pupillary defect, then they have by definition a posterior optic neuropathy or retrobulbar optic neuropathy. Now, if they have significant vision in one, loss of vision in one eye and a normal nerve and exam and no relative afferent pupillary defect, I would pull out the vertical prism because that's impossible. Um, and the answer would be, yeah, I mean, if they had, I probably would, if I couldn't do a biopsy, the MRI was normal. They have an APD. They have a ret by definition a retrobulbar optic neuropathy. Yeah, I, I would be tempted to treat them. I mean, of course, you want to know about other symptoms, but giant cell arteritis can, may have no other symptoms. Um, so, um, I know that some people. That's the end of my questions. I know that some people did have questions in the pre sort of the registration um, standpoint. I eliminated a whole lot of those questions that were not relevant to this topic because those are all questions that are good questions, but could could be part of a different, you know, many other webinars. Um, so I was going to just look at what I've got. Um, one of the questions is differentiating between hysteria and possibility of cortical blindness. So that's a toughie. I mean, hysteria would be non-organic. Whereas cortical blindness, I mean, an MRI is going to be the test that tells. Um, does an RAPD occur in a patient with normal visual acuity? Sure. If they've got bad peripheral vision in one eye and a normal eye the other, remember the RAPD has nothing to do with acuity. It has to do with asymmetric optic nerve damage. Um, I didn't include patients with amblyopia. In this discussion, certainly patients with amblyopia could have unexplained vision loss, but it, there's almost always going to be a history of amblyopia um, if you're seeing adults. So I didn't really include amblyopia. Um, are all sudden vision loss emergencies? I'm going to say yes. 
And that's about it for those questions. I think those are the, the most relevant to the topic that we're talking about today. So I think with that, um, thank you all for participating um, in this Orbis CyberSight uh, webinar. Um, uh, if you, I, I do a lot of traveling and a lot of speaking around the world. If you see me, please say hello, tell me what you thought about the webinar. Um, and please let Orbis and CyberSight know about other neuro-ophthalmology topics you may want to hear about in the future. And I wish you all a, a great rest of the day, whatever time of day that may be for you.